Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to give a relatively short talk, and there'll be lots of time for questions. So collect those comments and questions. This talk is about a book available now widely, uh, co-authored with Kevin Simler. I have a previous book that came out a year and a half ago, if you're interested in that. That one's on When Robots Rule the Earth. This one is on a completely different topic. So this book actually represents a conflict, we think, between the fields of psychology and the fields of policy analysis. Uh, we're saying that policy analysis, people have been neglecting a thing psychologists believe. And our book has been reviewed by psychologists, refereed by psychologists. It's in the psychology section. And psychologists have been saying, well, it's well written and, and it explains things well, but is there really anything new here? Didn't we already know all of this? But the policy analysts should think this is crazy. And this is completely nuts. And so we're trying to get this conflict between these disciplines to be uh, engaged. One side is wrong about something important. Now. I started out in physics, and then I moved to computer science. And in those fields, I noticed, as most people do, that they're eager for innovation. They're eager for improvements. Even though innovation's expensive and it's hard, it's disruptive, and most innovations fail, they are still eager for big improvements. That's the nature of physical devices and software. And when I first started reading about social science, I noticed there seemed to be a lot of really big improvements that were possible much larger than I could find in physics or software. That excited me, and that's one of the reasons I went into social science, because there seemed to be these huge improvements possible. But as I got into social science, I realized that the reason it was so easy to find big improvements is we almost never actually adopt them. They just sit there, decade after decade, available improvements we don't use. And that was a puzzle for me. Why are we so disinterested in social innovation and policy innovation compared to physical device and software innovation? And over the years, I've been puzzling over that, as well as other puzzles. And this book is summarizing my explanation why we are so interested in physical and software innovations more than social innovations. And my explanation is going to be in terms of hidden motives. Now, the kind of hidden motives I'm talking about, we can illustrate with some animals, uh, although they don't say anything about their motives, so they can't really be wrong. But when humans look at these motives, we tend to attribute the wrong motives. So most primates, like chimpanzees, spend a lot of time what they call grooming. They pick bugs and dirt out of the hair of the other animals. Now, that's useful. And we're tempted to say they are doing it because it's useful. They are helping each other. But it turns out that primates who have more dirt and grime in their area or bigger backs that need to be cleaned, they don't actually groom each other longer. The ones that do groom each other longer are just in the bigger groups. And apparently, grooming is a political activity for chimpanzees and other primates. They're doing it to reaffirm their alliances with each other, to say, I'm with you because I'm cleaning your back. So we are tempted to say this is being helpful, but it's really apparently more about politics. The bird on the right is the babbler bird. And it does lives in groups. And some of the birds will sit high on a branch uh, of a bush nearby and watch out for predators. And if a predator comes, they will yell. They will therefore give their position away to the predator more. They are putting themselves more at risk. They will yell about the predator. And then all the other birds nearby can go hide. They are also the same birds will be at the top of the branches will be seen giving food to the other birds. Now, both of these things look like they're helpful behavior. They are helping each other. But what turns out, the birds will fight for the, uh, the right to be on the top of the branch. And they will stuff food down the throat of the other one who doesn't want it. So this is apparently more of a status hierarchy. Uh, the high status birds are the ones on the top branches. And the high status birds are the ones who are shoving foods down the throat of the other birds. So even though it looks like they're being helpful, they're actually having different motives than we might see. So this is a clue to the idea that humans, when we look at this behavior, we're not really that accurate about guessing motives. Uh, half century ago, there was a set of what's called split brain experiments. One of the leaders got a Nobel Prize on the basis of this eventually. 
And what had happened is your brain is in two halves, and there's a connection between. And for some reason, they, they split the brain apart. They broke the connection between the two halves of the brain. That means there are really two brains sitting in these people's skull. One brain is connected to one eye, one ear, one hand, one mouth. And so they could do these experiments where they would talk to one brain where the other brain couldn't hear. And they might say, stand up. And then they would use their one arm and one leg, et cetera, to stand up. And the rest of the body would go along. And then they would talk to the other brain and say, why are you standing up? Now, the honest answer is, I don't know. <laughs> you were just talking to the other brain. But that's not what happens. What happens is they consistently make something up. Like, I wanted to get a Coke. So that's the kind of brains you have. If you don't know why you do something, you are ready to just make up an excuse and believe it and be very confident. It's not like they said, I don't know, I'm not sure, maybe it was getting up a Coke. They are confidently giving an explanation for something they don't know. So that's a hint that you might not be that aware of your motives. <laughs> Because you are built to always have an explanation, even if you don't actually know what your real motives were. Imagine you are an actor or actress and ask to act the following scene. There's two of you at a romantic dinner at a restaurant. You are sitting there, uh, enjoying the food and talking to each other, saying things like, I love you so much. No, I love you more. We are having such a wonderful relationship. This is so great. If you ask an actor, can you act that scene, they will say, I can't act that scene. <laughs> That's a terrible scene for an actor to act. Why? Because there's only one level. We expect there to be multiple levels in a scene like this. So th in order to act the scene, the actor will have to say to themselves, why am I here and being so nice? Am I about to break up with her? Am I afraid she's going to break up with me? I need another agenda, another level in this thing in order to be an effective actor. Because we all expect people to have hidden motives behind the motives they're saying. That's such a consistent explanation, you can't really act scenes without it. I'm going to go over 10 different areas of life in this talk. Our book goes through the first third of the book going over the general idea of why you might expect us not to be aware of our motives. I've just given you a few hints. And then we go over 10 areas of life. And the original part of a book is to say, not only in principle might people sometimes be unaware of their motives, it's actually true a lot of a lot of, a lot of your actual behavior. <laughs> it's all over the time in your lives, you are not aware of your motives. So we're going to go over laughter, body language, conversation, consumption, art, charity, school, medicine, religion, and politics. Quickly, of course. And we're going to talk about the hidden motives, how the motive you think you have isn't really what's going on. So let me start off with laughter, and then I'll generalize a bit from it. You guys laugh all the time. You enjoy laughing. You might even say, I love him because he makes me laugh. But if you ask why do people laugh, they have all these theories that don't make much sense. They might say, I laugh at jokes. I laugh at things that are funny. I laughed when I can be superior. I laughed when there's something weird. And actually, we have a number of observations about laughter that don't make much sense from this point of view. Most of the time you're laughing, it has nothing to do with a joke. Uh, you'll laugh 30 times as often when you're around other people as when you're alone. If there's a speaker like myself, the speaker laughs 50% more often than the audience does, or the person listening. And we laugh at things we'd be embarrassed to say straight out. So you might laugh at the joke, don't drop the soap in the prison shower, ha ha ha, because we're laughing at prison rape. Isn't that a fun topic? <laughs> well, no, in, in a serious conversation, you'd be horrified to show indifference to prison rape. But in a joke, it's fine. Why is it so much more OK to laugh about such things? Well, apparently. Uh, as biologists have discovered, and psychologists discovered, laughter is a play signal. Most animals play. Our ancestors played. And play is where you practice. So you might play fight. You might play chase. Uh, you might play all sorts of things. And while you're playing, you need a way to show that we're still playing if somebody seems like they might get hurt. So in real fighting, so you, you get hurt, and that's the point. <laughs> when you're play fighting, you're not supposed to get hurt, except you might accidentally get hurt. And then you need a way to say, it's OK. I'm not hurt. <laughs> we're still playing. It's all OK. And that's what laughter is for humans. Now, we do a lot of play as social play because we're very social creatures, which is why we laugh and play with things like don't drop the prison <laughs> a shower, the, the soap in the prison shower, because we're using laughter and play to press the boundaries of our social rules. We pretend to violate rules, and we allow ourselves to violate rules in play and say, well, yeah, I'm just joking. You, you can't take that serious. <laughs> and then we learn about the various boundaries of our social rules, and we learn what people actually take seriously and what they don't by what people are willing to laugh at. 
And so uh, all that's true and it all makes sense, but notice you're not aware of it. Why aren't you aware? Isn't this a reasonable thing to be doing? Well, if you were aware that you were violating the rules while you're laughing, maybe that doesn't work as a rule violation. <laughs> it only works when you can pretend you're not aware of it. So the general pattern here is going to be that for each of these behaviors, there's a standard story about why we do it, like laughter. And then uh, we're going to focus on the kind of standard story that would most be given in public, like by politicians giving a speech, or you might have in a letter of application somewhere. And then we're going to identify a number of puzzles that don't make sense from that usual story's point of view, things that are in conflict. And then I'm going to offer an alternative explanation, a motive that makes more sense of the details of this behavior. And uh, they'll all be reasonable motives, but you might ask and notice, well, why just aren't we aware of these things? If they're all reasonable things to do, why do we think we're doing one thing when we're really doing another thing? And we'll come back to that later. Now, some caveats. We're going to focus on looking at the pattern of behavior and ask what sort of motive can make sense of that behavior. It's not about what's consciously in your head or what you're aware of at any one moment. It's not about your intentions or thoughts. It's about what is going on in your world or your life such that you would tend to do one thing or another. And that's what we mean by motive here, sort of the underlying force that produces your behavior. In almost all areas of life, like school, they're complicated. They are, ha have enormous variety of people involved. So thousands of motives, of course, will be relevant for almost everything. So we can only really be talking here about the main motives, the most common motives. And so the motive that you usually say is a motive that sometimes applies. And then that's, in fact, why it works as an excuse. So, the dog ate my homework only works as an excuse because sometimes dogs eat homework. The dragon ate my homework doesn't work <laughs> because there are no dragons. <laughs> so uh, it's not about the usual motive never happening. It's just happening less than we like to say. That's the point here. And you guys all will vary in how aware you are of your motives in different contexts. For each of you, most of the things I say, you'll say, yeah, that makes sense. I get it. And then for a few areas, you will be much more resistant because all of you have something in life that's precious to you. <laughs> the most sacred thing to you. And when I get to talking about cynical explanations for your motives there, you will not be so eager <laughs> to embrace cynical explanations about the thing you're, that's precious to you. So we only really need to convince you, say, of seven out of 10 of our cases to convince you there's a lot of hidden motives going on. And that's our agenda here. We don't need to convince you of all 10 of them for each one of you. And so the claim is the hidden motives are widespread. That's the thing I'm going to try to convince you. OK, so now we're going to go through another nine areas of life and each one doing the same pattern. So body language. Uh, you may know that to, uh, we communicate a lot through body language. We don't just use our words. But we aren't very aware of it. You guys spend years in school learning how to talk and how to write, and you have no time almost learning body language. <laughs> Yet you're all very skilled at body language, which is puzzling. Now, it turns out that when you and any friend or anybody are interacting at a one-on-one -on -one level, you will negotiate a status <laughs> level. R who is the higher status? And, and who is how much higher status. You will have what's called status moves. You will negotiate that, and that will be expressed via who looks directly where, who looks away, who uh, initiates the rhythm of the post, whether your body stance is wide open or closed. All of these features of your body language will communicate who's a higher or lower status in the communication. But most of you will deny that either of you is higher status <laughs> in most interactions you have with other people. You're oblivious to that, even though actors need to learn this to look realistic on stage. They need to learn what body language actually looks like, and then they need to learn how to adapt their body language to the circumstance, whether they're higher or lower status. Now, uh, we also use body language, say, to flirt. You, as you probably know, you're not supposed to be flirting most of the time, at least overtly. But we do flirt a lot of the time. But we do it in a deniable way. Our body language flirts, but we say we weren't doing anything. And so we use our body language both to do status moves and flirting and many other things. And we're, do, we're saying things that we wouldn't want to admit verbally. And that's partly why, perhaps, we aren't aware of it. We, are, we have plausible deniability. If I ask, why is your shoulder this way, you might say, well, it's just more comfortable that way. <laughs> why is your eyes looking away? Well, there's something interesting over there. That, and you would just make up reasons like that, rather than admit to going through this whole body language structure. Conversation. You guys talk to each other a lot, I'm sure. You have many conversations. Why? If I ask you, why did you spend the last half hour talking to that person, <coughs> probably the most common explanation you might come up with is sharing information. I know things they don't. They know things I don't. If we talk to each other, we'll learn things from each other. Isn't that great? Now, there's a number of things that don't make sense from that point of view. If we were just about sharing information, we would keep track of debts. I just told you three useful things. You haven't told me anything. It's your turn. 
Uh, we would be more eager to listen than to talk. We would sit there and collect information, and then maybe someone says, hey, you haven't talked yet. It's your turn to share us some information, and then we'd be forced to share some information. We would talk about the most important things to us, the most valuable topics. Instead, we often have conversations that are filled with relative trivialities. And we have this rule that the conversation is supposed to smoothly follow a path across these trivial topics. You're not supposed to suddenly jump from one topic to another. None of these make much sense from the point of view of, an in, of sharing information. However, more plausibly what's going on in ordinary conversation, as well as in academia and news media conversations, is that you are showing off a mental backpack of tools and resources. The rule is the conversation will go somewhere. You won't be able to control it. Whatever we talk about, it's your job to come up with something interesting to say. It's your job to show us how many tools and resources you have in your mind such that if, you're, if you were going to be my ally, you would have all these resources at your disposal, because I would be at your disposal. And we're showing off all the things we know and all the contacts we have and all the skills we have through conversation. And that also happens in news media and academia, which is why the news media and academia actually don't usually talk about the most important things to us, but they successfully show off people as being impressive in terms of these kind of skills. Most of the things you buy, if I ask, why did you buy that thing? Why did you buy that phone, that laptop, that shirt, that car? You will point to features of the product and say, well, look at all the things I can do with this. You will point to specific features of a product and say, this is why I bought this thing. Uh, it costs this much, and it does these things. But as you probably have noticed through your life, people pay a lot of attention to how the things they buy make them look to other people. Their clothes, their cars, their laptops, et cetera. They are very attentive to that. And Many advertisement of products, like the one up here for beer, don't actually say anything about the product. You might think that if you were interested in the features of the product, and that's why you would buy it, that the advertising would focus on the features of the product, the price, the salinity, the <laughs> bubbliness, whatever it is that would be the thing you like about the product, they would be trying to tell you about that. But a great many ads don't tell you much of the product at all. They give you some feeling here of the kind of person who, and the might, mood they might be in when buying this product. Uh, we also notice that people pay a lot more for ads that many more people see, like Super Bowl ads. We notice that products like Rolex watches are advertised to everybody, even when hardly anybody buys them. And some products like Priuses are made to look especially different. Plausibly, what's going on is that we are using the products we buy and the, th and the services we buy to show other people our identity. So when an ad like this shows you that this kind of beer is a sort of beer bought by people who like the beach, then you think, if I want to project the image of the sort of person who likes the beach, then I want to be holding one of these beers. <laughs> and so the advertisement creates a language by which people can express themselves, who they are, and what they identify with, and what they admire through the products they buy. And then it doesn't that much matter what the beer tastes like. What matters is the symbol that we've learned to associate it, which is why we uh, buy, you know, why expensive products need to be advertised. It only works to buy a Rolex watch to impress everybody with what a rich watch you have. It's everybody's seen the ads that show the Rolex watches are only the sort of things that rich people can buy. If, if nobody else knew that Rolex watches were rich people's watches, what would be the point of owning one? And so again, we use advertising and our products to show off all these personal characteristics about what kind of person we are. But if I told you why did you buy that beer or that product, that's not what you would say. So you would not be admitting to those motives. Why do we like art? Usually the story of art is some kind of experience. It might be beauty, but it could be a striking experience or a shocking experience. But the art itself produces an experience. And you go to a movie and something happens to you. You listen to music and something happens to you. You experience the art. However, it turns out there's a number of other things that we like about art that matter to us other than the experience they produce. So for example, um, Long ago, when photography was hard, people liked realistic art. That was very, <laughs> and they, they paid a lot for that, and that was what they highly valued. As soon as photography became possible, realistic art value suddenly declined enormously, and people were much more interested in more abstract art that was unrealistic, because that's what was hard. <laughs> Turns out that we care a lot about how difficult it is to make our art. We care about what sort of techniques it is, the materials that they use, how long it takes. We even care about how many artists are used to produce an art. We like art better when one person made it than when a whole team made it. Uh, and uh, we like things that are less practical. And so more plausibly, what's going on in art is rather than wanting the experience, we want to identify with and admire the artist. And not only do we want to connect to them, we want to show off our ability to distinguish good from bad art, i.e. impressive from unimpressive art. 
And we use art as this way to enjoy the experiences that show off our ability to create art or to identify good art. But that's not what we would say. If you say, what do you like about this painting? You might say, that must have been a really clever artist who could do all that careful technique. Charity. People say they contribute to charity to help. That's the usual story. You're helping somebody, either personally with your time or with money. But it turns out we actually pay very little attention to how effective, art it, effective charity is. Uh, there's an effective altruism movement that tries to go the opposite, but it highlights the difference. Most people are not looking very much about how effective charity is. They're focused on effectiveness. So they find the one most effective charity and give all their money to it, but they really prefer many charities. Uh, we prefer to give money to identifiable people nearby or, or help to other, but we don't, we're less interested in helping people far away in the world who might need more help than the people near us. Uh, we don't very interested in helping the far future, which is actually cheaper because of interest rates. <laughs> we aren't interested in what's called marginal charity, where we make slight variations on our behavior, which have an enormous cost-benefit ratio. And more plausibly, what's going on with charity is we want to show that we have a sympathy to people around us who hurt. If we see somebody near us hurting, we will feel bad and want to help. And people around us, they like that. <laughs> If people around you know that you have this sense, sense that if somebody near you is hurting, you will help, then they will like to be near you because then you might help them if they were in need. Your willingness to help people far away in the world or in the future doesn't really show <laughs> your willingness to help the people around you. And so you're much less interested in showing your willingness to help the most in need in the world. You really care more about showing the people around you that you would help them if they were in need. This section is drawn from my colleague Brian Kaplan's recent book, The Case Against Education, which I recommend. So he has a whole book-length treatment. I'm just going to summarize that here. The usual story about why you guys are in school, as you may know, is to learn the material. If you learn the proper material, then later on you will get good jobs or be good citizens or good sp you know, spouses. Whatever it is, you will become a better person because of the material you learned. That's the usual story about school. But a lot of things about school just don't make sense from that point of view. For example, I went, when I lived near Stanford University, I would go sit in on Stanford classes and get the high quality Stanford education with, for free. I didn't register, I didn't apply. I just walked in and sat down. Nobody tries to stop you from doing that. Nobody cares. If I tried to forge a Stanford degree certificate, they would be all over me. <laughs> but just going and get the actual education, nobody cares. That should make you wonder. It turns out, as you may know, uh, you don't actually remember very much of what you learned. If you think back for a class you took four years ago, you, you remember almost nothing. <laughs> and even the things you do remember aren't very useful. And you'll find that out in the next decade or two, <laughs> that most of what you learn here just isn't very useful, even the few things you remember. You, you do get paid more and by employers for every more year of schooling you get. But the last year of high school and the last year of college get paid three times as much as the other years. <laughs> but you don't learn more in the last year. So something else is going on there. Uh, People who are bartenders and who have a college degree, they get paid more than bartenders who have a high school degree or bartenders who have no degree. But there, hardly anything they learned at school was relevant for being a bartender. And the world of education research has for decades collected better ways to learn the material. We've studied and know lots of ways that you could learn the material faster and more effectively and nobody cares. <laughs> Schools almost never adopt any of these things that people have worked out that help you learn material faster. Why? Why is there so little interest in that? Well, more plausibly, we talk about learning the material, but what we're really doing is showing off. By going to school and succeeding, you are showing that you are smart, conscientious, conformist, that you have you know, adopted the habits and, and uh, world of modern workplace practices that you get, that you could take ambiguous assignments and that are mildly boring and produce uh, and deliver on a deadline a few weeks away. You, you can do that because you've been doing it in school. And so that shows that you are uh, good for school. So it's less that school is creating you, and it's more that it's showing you, it's validating and testing you that you have the sort of characteristics employers want, uh, as opposed to changing you. Of course, other things happen there. We network with each other. We indoctrinate each other, things like that. But um, now this may be the most surprising for many of you, because in our society, we think of medicine as very sacred and precious. Why do you go to the doctor, to the hospital? To get healthy, right? That is, you're usually healthy, sometimes you get sick, then they can help you get well again. However, it turns out there's almost no correlation between health and medicine. That is, when we look at regions where they happen to spend more on medicine, more hours of visits, more dollars spent, versus regions that do less, there's basically no difference in the health. 
In addition, we've done randomized experiments where sometimes we just give some random people a low price for medicine, they consume a lot more. Other people a high price, they consume less. No difference in the health between the two groups. Uh, so there's, all, people are enormously, I've taught health economics, people are all over medicine. They're really interested in medical regulation, medical policy, and we spend 18% of GDP on medicine. There are other things that have much stronger obvious effects, correlations with health that people have very little interest in. Uh, exercise, air quality, social status, uh, sleep, nutrition, those things have much larger correlations with health, yet if you try to talk to people about policy based on that, they just have very little interest. And they don't want to spend much on it either. It also turns out people are not very interested in private information about the quality of medicine. You can offer them privately to show them that some treatments are better than others and they just don't care. There was a randomized experiment years ago where people about to undergo heart surgery, which faced a few percent risk of death in that surgery, they were said, hey, we've got information, which usually wasn't available, about the hospitals and doctors in your area and what the death rate is people getting surgery at those places and people. And we said, how much are you willing to pay for this? And they, one of the prices was 50 bucks. How much would you, really, would you be willing to pay 50 bucks to find out this information that might help you reduce your chance of dying by, say, 1%? Only 8% were willing to pay 50 bucks. <laughs> These are people about to undergo heart surgery. And when they just gave people information for free, they didn't use it. <laughs> so people are just not very interested in information about the quality of medicine. And we have other uh, puzzles about medicine as well. And more plausibly, the explanation is we actually use medicine to show that we care. So think about a child scraping their knee, mommy kisses the boo-boo. There's not actually a direct medical effect of kissing the boo-boo, but you feel better, they feel better, and you show that you care. Uh, think of the analogy of Valentine's chocolates. So on Valentine's, we have a tra tradition of giving somebody chocolates to show you care about them. Now, when you try to buy some chocolates to give them on Valentine's Day, do you say, well, how hungry are they? How many, how many chocolates are they hungry for today? Not really. Because the amount of chocolates you buy is more about how much do I have to buy to show that, that I care more than somebody who cares less than me. And so even if you buy more chocolates than you really need, you need to buy that many. Similarly in medicine, in order to show that we care about each other, we need to buy as much medicine as it takes to spend a lot to show that we care, even if most of that medicine isn't very useful on the margin. When you ask for, when you buy some quality chocolates, you might ask, what quality chocolates should I get? Or what brand should I get to show that I'm giving them quality chocolates? You realize when you're making this brand or quality choice, you're only interested in common signals of quality, shared signals of quality. If you happen to privately think that one kind of chocolate is more or less quality than others, but you don't think the other person knows on either side of the relationship, that doesn't influence. You get a piece kind of chocolate that they think everybody thinks is good, you happen to not think it's very good, but you don't believe they could have known that, then you still give them full credit for being generous. So that's plausibly why we don't pay much attention to quality of medicine. We're mostly focused on common signals of medical quality. You give people the kind of medicine everybody's supposed to give them, and you don't actually care how effective any particular medicine is as long as it's the sort of one everybody's supposed to give, which is why you're not interested in private signals about the quality of medicine. Religion. What's it for? What's it going on? If you ask people specifically, why are you doing these particular religious practices, the most common explanation, at least in our society, will be, I have these beliefs. I have religious beliefs, and that's producing my religious behavior. I believe in this document, I believe in this source, and they are telling me to do these things, and therefore I'm doing those things. Now, if that's all was going on, you wouldn't expect necessarily people to do very well, unless they were picking good sources for these beliefs. They, they might just be gullible and, and believing a bunch of stuff that doesn't work, and therefore they would just be doing worse in life. But in fact, religious people consistently do better on pretty much every measure we have. <laughs> There's people who are more religious, who go to church more often, et cetera, have stronger beliefs, uh, even if they're not atheists, they're just more or less strongly religious. More religious people uh, live longer, uh, earn more income, uh, get married more often, marriages stay together, there's less crime, less drugs. You know, all the things that might be good, they're correlated more with religion. But that's puzzling if it's just about having a bunch of mistaken beliefs. More plausibly, and this is just the standard uh, conclusion from the social science of religion, I'm just, again, as, as in most of these things, just repeating the standard conclusion, Religion is more about bonding yourself to a community by sacrificing for that community. 
And so when religions have all these rules about what you're supposed to wear or supposed to eat or strange things you're supposed to believe in, well, those are expensive signals showing that you're loyal to that community. Your willingness to pay those costs show that you have a commitment. And a community that has members who have paid that commitment, they can feel more bonded to each other and they can rely on each other more. And in fact, more strongly bonded religious communities for more extreme beliefs actually do rely on each other more. They are actually able to share more, ensure each other more, et cetera, because they've passed this test of bonding. Our last chapter here is politics. Now, why do you get involved in politics? And I don't just mean vote, I mean talk about it, read articles about it, et cetera, argue about it. What's the point? Why are you doing that? If I ask you that, your usual explanation will be, I'm trying to make the world better. I'm trying to make my nation better. I'm trying to make my city better, my community better. I'm making the world better via making better policy. We're going to argue about policy, and then a policy is going to be adopted, and we're going to have the better policies because I helped. That's your motive that you say you're involved in politics. And as you may know, it doesn't make sense of a lot of the details of your, your political behavior. You are surprisingly ignorant about an awful lot of politics. You're pretty gullible, actually, and pretty emotional in ways that you wouldn't be about other things. You have strong preferences to be around other people who share your views, even if that doesn't actually produce better policy. When you have a vote that you are more decisive on, that is, you have a bigger chance of influencing the outcome, it doesn't actually influence your behavior very much. It doesn't make you more likely to vote or talk about politics when you actually have a bigger influence. Uh, you are very interested in taking positions that help your groups and for your politicians that way. Actually, you want your politicians to take positions you agree with even when those politicians have no influence over that kind of policy. <laughs> And when politicians show that they are good at doing things like passing bills and doing politics behind the scene, you don't reward them for that. You don't reward politicians who are actually good at their job of doing politics, and you really don't want to talk compromise. If it were all about producing policies that worked, you, compromise would have to be the center of the game. You would have to be focused on what kind of compromises will I accept to get what else. But you almost never want to talk about politics. You want to talk about what you would do if you were king or queen if you ruled the world. That's the kind of politics you like to talk about, which isn't actually very useful. Uh, so more plausibly, you are apparatchiks, which is a name for a so Soviet uh, loyal politician. Uh, let me give you the story of once upon a time back in the old Soviet Union, Stalin was alive. There was a, a meeting where Stalin wasn't there, but his name was mentioned. And at the mention of his name, everybody got up and started clapping and cheering. Yay, Stalin. And they clapped and cheered for 10 minutes. <laughs> and of course, near the end of this period, everybody's thinking, well, am I going to be the first one to stop clapping and cheering for Stalin? Because if I do, maybe you'll think I'm less loyal to Stalin than the other people. Finally, one guy did stop clapping and sit down, and whew, everybody else could sit down, and that guy went to Siberia that night. <laughs> that's what happens in a world of loyalty, and the argument is that that's the world you're largely living in. You are largely trying to show your loyalty to people around you that you share their political allegiances. You don't actually care very much about influencing the world or the city, et cetera. That never gets back to you because you have very little influence. But you do influence what the people around you think of you, and that's important to you because people actually are much more interested in dating or marrying and hiring people who share their political views. And that's a strong effect on your lives. All right, so I went over 10 areas. You, some of them are precious to you. I didn't convince you. Maybe I've convinced you for most of the rest. But now the question is, why don't we know about these things? If this is what we're really doing, why don't we know? Now, humans have the biggest brains of all the primates. And there's a standard correlation where bigger brains had to do with having more complicated social worlds. So primates' main obstacle, the reason they had big brains, is because of the complicated social world they lived in. It wasn't about the nature or the environment or making tools. It was about the people around them. And uh, humans, in addition to what the other primates would do, created social norms. These are rules that you're supposed to follow, and if you see somebody violating, violating the rule, you're supposed to tell people and do something. So language and weapons allowed people, humans to do this in ways that other primates couldn't. So with these social norms, a lot of these norms are expressed in terms of motives. If I hit you accidentally, that's OK. If I hit you on purpose, that's not. And so when we're thinking of, are we about to violate a norm, or is somebody else about to violate a norm, or have they violated a norm, we're thinking about their motives. And we're asking what motives we can attribute their behavior to. So as a result of this, you guys are constantly observing your behavior and other people's behavior and asking what motives can we explain these behavior with. And because of that, you are trying to make sure you have a good story about your motives <laughs> for whatever you're doing. And so in fact, you are not the king or president of your brain. The person I'm talking to, the conscious part of your mind, you are the press secretary. 
Your job isn't to know what's actually going on. Your job is to have a good explanation for whatever's going on when the press asks you questions. <laughs> That's why in your head, you have these ideas of your motives that are the nice sounding motives, the best sounding motives you can come up with that plausibly fit your behavior. That's the thing that's in your head and that's what you think you're doing. You say to yourself, yes, this is what I'm doing because that's what your job is. Your job as the press secretary to come up with the good explanations because uh, that's what you'll be challenged on and it's really important to you as a, as a human who evolved from humans who had a very social world who were very uh, enforced with norms. That is, they had the rules and you had to not violate the rules otherwise you'd be punished. And so your job is to make sure you are not caught violating rules. And that means you're, you need to have good motives. <laughs> and so many of these motives that we hide are motives that would violate a norm. Bragging in particular. Forgers have an ancient, ancient norm against bragging. And many of these things are showing off. <laughs> and you're not supposed to show off. And of course, you do it all the time, but you do it indirectly and you pretend you don't. OK, so this is my last slide. So far in policy, I told you that this is a conflict between psychology and policy analysis. In policy analysis, people like education researchers, medical researchers, et cetera, they have accepted and taken at face value the usual story about our motives. We usually say we go to school to learn the material, we go to the doctor to get healthy, and what they usually do overwhelmingly is take that at face value and try to work out policy reforms that will help you learn the material faster, help you get well more at the doctor, et cetera, all the way down the line. Better policy, pol policy through politics. And we know we are lying. <laughs> We don't actually want those things. And so we are not very interested in the policy reforms that they come up with, which I think explains in part why we're much less interested in policy and social reforms, because they are not directed to the problems we actually have and care about. If we want to produce policies that people will be willing to adopt, we will need to solve a harder problem. Today we've been solving the problem of giving people more of the things they say they want. Now we have to find a reform that lets them continue to pretend to want the things they say they want while actually giving them more of the thing they actually want. That's a harder design problem and has more moving parts, but plausibly, if we could solve that problem, then we would have a lot more interest in our policy proposals. Now, of course, they, maybe they can't admit to the interest, <laughs> at least in terms of the actual advantages, but if we were somehow to accidentally dump it on their lap, they wouldn't say no, they wouldn't resist because it's actually what they want. All right, and that's the end. <laughs> Comments and questions? Uh, I have a question about your, uh, the data on religion. Does the data take into account different religions? Uh, if people from this religion have this impact on their life, that other religion, that other impact, or it's just like one block? My point, I, I'm asking this because if it's just one block, it could be that some religion with very positive effects would be affecting the mean. And there would be other religions with the same social effects that you mentioned that are not really helpful, but people still follow them. Uh, there's a large literature on religion, has many parts. Uh, certainly, typically religion helps people at the personal level. There's a negative correlation at the social level, however. Nations and regions with more religions tend to do worse, but individuals with more religion tend to do better uh, across a wide range of religions. Well, certainly, we see that there are religions that demand more people or less, so Unitarians, say famously, don't demand very much, and then they have lower commitment and lower advantages. Uh, Ancient religions actually didn't care about your beliefs very much. So the modern world, like Judeo-Christianity, et cetera, we, they care much more about your beliefs. But in the ancient world, you just had to do the right things. You had to pray at the right times and do the right rituals. And that's what people cared about. They didn't really care what you believed. <laughs> so uh, they didn't, people didn't say they went, did religion long ago because of the beliefs, because it didn't matter so much then. <laughs> that's a few examples of. But does the data distinguish the results of different religions? Or does it treat religion as one homogenous thing? Again, it does distinguish in many ways. So yes, so we have data that says high commitment religions, religions that ask a lot from you, actually have stronger benefits for the individuals involved than low commitment religions. Like Unitarians don't get as much benefits. That, that's part of the data. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Claudia. Um, hi, Claudia.
and it wouldn't be true. <laughs> so I would say, like, uh, how would you justify that? So, so I say, uh, when you're going to school, Robert, yes? Can I ask you for that? I, I don't know about you, but you repeat the question? Can you, can you repeat the question? Yes. So she asks, could I, instead of saying hidden motives, could I talk about externalities? Would that be equivalent to what I'm saying? And, and I say, no, that would not be equivalent. Uh, an externality would be a consequence of your behavior that didn't explain your choices. That is, you don't choose in order to produce externalities. So it might be a, a consequence that we could observe of your behavior, but uh, that would tend to be unpatterned with respect to your choices. I say these hidden motives I've claimed about are quite consistently patterned in a way that makes it seem like you intended to get these outcomes. <laughs> you wanted these outcomes. They weren't happenstances. And that's why I need a lot of detail in these things. So the, the whole if I just say medicine isn't very effective, <laughs> You might think, well, uh, that's just something I don't know about. I'm ignorant about it. Uh, it happens to be true, but it's not an intention. I didn't, it's not part of my intention of my behavior. I was trying to get healthy. I just was failing. But the more details I can show you uh, that, aren't, that don't fit with this idea that you were trying to get healthy, the more I'm arguing that you were trying for something else. And you're getting the something else. You're just not getting the thing you say. And so it's all about the details. So in each of these areas and in our chapters, it's about these specific details that don't fit with the ex usual explanation that fit better with the other motive. Can I follow up? So it seems like you are trying to draw a causation into the motive. But, uh, but the slides, at least from my, my interpretation, you're pointing out here's this and here's this. There's a correlation. But how did you prove the causation? How do you analyze that? So this is how sort of inference works at a very basic level. You know, there has to be multiple theories of the world. And then for each theory, you ask, what world would you expect to see if that theory were true? And then you have to look at the actual data you have and say, which pattern of predictions better fits the actual data? That's how all of inference goes. And that's how causal inference goes as well. That's pretty much how we do all science and inference. At the end, it comes down to having a set of alternative theories in mind for each theory asking, if that theory were true, what does that predict about the world we should see? And then you're comparing those predictions to the actual things you see and saying, which fits better? So that's the kind of argument I'm making here. I'm saying, there's a usual story you have, and I can outline the kind of predictions it might make. And I can say, here's the other theory I'm offering, and here's the other kind of predictions I might make. And then I'm saying the th actual patterns we see better fit the second explanation than the first. Although, as I say, all the explanations have some degree of truth. That is, all of the official stories are sometimes true. We do sometimes learn things at school. We do sometimes get well at the doctors, et cetera. We do sometimes make better policy through politics. <laughs> it's about the percentage. It's about the fraction of the behavior that we're trying to explain. And so the claim here is that, yes. So I'm just curious, you said the correlation between between religions yeah. that require a higher content of the people who want to know <coughs> and greater personal um, benefit. Does that apply to politics and are the other areas that you look at as well? In other words, like if you were involved in a political group that has a stronger ideological motivation and is more politically active um, and requires <coughs> more of you as an individual, does that also um, well, it turns out um, they've done studies of um, you have a grant to give out to a student, and we give you some descriptions of students, and some of them share your political views, and some of them don't. You're much more likely to give the grant to the ones who share your political views. And if you say, do you want you know, do you want to date or marry somebody who shares your political views? There's enormous um, preference there. So. Just from the literal point of view of wanting people around you to like you, <laughs> to date you and give you jobs and give you scholarships, uh, that right there says that uh, you are rewarded for sharing the political views of the people you will be interacting with. Uh, th that doesn't mean there's a net social benefit per se, uh, but that doesn't mean you personally are rewarded for being politically loyal. So my question would be, does that, you benefit personally, right? It's not about the social benefit. Right. I don't know, but I, I do think uh, groups that are very ideologically committed to each other, they do often sacrifice more for each other. 
And so this benefit that I was talking about, religion is primarily a benefit of commitment and, and, and relying on each other for insurance. There are other benefits you could have from a group, but, but that kind of benefit goes there. This is a very strongly uh, Austrian school here. So we do not, we, we would disagree with you that, uh, many of us at least, would disagree with you that statistical observation is necessary for all science. I, I didn't mean to make, make a claim about necessarity. I just was talking about the usual relationship between theory and data. Okay. And my question would be, we uh, often choose to violate norms, right, both in private and public. So, the uh, following norms uh, is a conscious choice. It's not something we do automatically and without thinking. Or at least... Um, sometimes it is. So, sometimes it might be, but as a general rule, uh, you, you can say that we, we don't think about norms. Perhaps we can prove that we always think about norms, but certainly there are instances where what I'm saying is there is a counter example to we don't think about norms, right? I certainly wouldn't claim you never think about norms. I won't claim you always think about norms. I will make the usual observation that, you know, you think about very few of your behaviors. <laughs> you do a lot more than you ever think about. <laughs> your, your conscious mind is paying attention to only a small fraction of the choices you make. So as that necessarily then, uh, most of your choices are unconscious. And therefore, most of your norm following or avoiding choices are probably unconscious because that's just what most, most of your choices are. Um, but, but certainly, we sometimes think about norms and sometimes not. No, it's okay. I, I'm, I'm going to rephrase it a little. I would say almost all of us care a lot about being social. It's not, there are very few of us don't care. I, I might more say some of us, like me, are intrinsically nerdy. <laughs> that is, we just don't have as in good intuitive social skill sense. So the machine inside our head calculating all the social things that we need to do so that we don't have to think about it, it just isn't as good a machine. So when you're nerdy, uh, you're often trying more consciously to think things through because your intuition doesn't work as well. And so nerds more often not sure how to manage the line of pretending things, so nerds are more often just going to try to go the sincere strategy. <laughs> if peop They're going to more believe that they go to school to learn the material, and then they're just going to try to learn the material. <laughs> so, so there's a certain ner sincere nerd syndrome whereby a sincere, socially unskilled person will just go with the, the story of the things we say we're doing and just try to stick close to that because they don't feel they know how to be hypocritical very well because <laughs> that's just a complicated social thing. And so in that sense, that's the correlation I might give <laughs> with uh, being more or less hypocritical <laughs> is just uh, certain people are just more sincere in general. And that's not because they don't care as much about people exactly. They just don't, can't manage the social complexity as well. <laughs> And so this sort of book might be more useful for you if you, like me, you're more of a nerd. And then you will notice the puzzles the book is based on more if you're a nerd, because if you're just an ordinary person with ordinary social skills, you'll just glide through life doing the right thing and thinking the right thing and not noticing they disagree with each other because you're just socially skilled. It's when you're not socially skilled that you'll try to think things through and realize things don't make sense. Maybe people aren't rational and they're voting or I'm using voting as based on my choice here. 
but how do you intend to, how does that, how does that factor in? At all to your, to the equation that we have people at like policy analysts, if we're looking at it from this perspective, we have to pick and choose for our people. I don't at all claim that you should trust any particular source of policy advice. I'm not saying set aside your doubts and just believe. <laughs> that's, that's not at all what I'm saying. I'm in fact showing you more different ways that they could be untrustworthy. <laughs> because uh, even though they think they're doing the right thing, they're just wrong. So I'm saying that your current policy analysts are wrong more than they realize in a big way, and I'm telling you what specifically way they are wrong, which is a reason to trust them less at the moment because they are just making really huge mistakes. To follow up on that, what you were saying here in the, in the second half of the, of the slide is that they are wrong and therefore that's exactly what they're doing now or that's what they, that's what they should be doing. I was kind of confused where you're going. If you want to take on the policy analyst role, which you might, you could do that as a contributor to government policy, but you can do it through private agencies and organizations as well. You might be an employee at Google and trying to come up with a policy for Google. You might be a person at a church trying to come up with a policy for your church. Whatever level at which you are recommending policy, I'm saying uh, unless you're paying attention to this effect, you are just wrong. <laughs> you are missing the big picture, and your recommendations are likely to be misguided and ineffectual. So. Uh, you could just quit trying to do policy analysis anywhere and go do something else with your life, which would be fine with me. But if you're going to make recommendations to anybody, your church, your company, your, your nation, whoever you're making recommendations to, if you don't know what's actually going on, you will be misguided and make bad recommendations. I'm not saying that any particular person should be empowered to act on knowing the truth. I'm telling you this is more the truth of what's going on. If you're going to try to be effective, you should know the truth. That doesn't mean I'm endorsing any particular political power, political faction, political action. I'm not telling you to, to reinvent kings and put them in charge. <laughs> uh, I'm just telling you, if you want to have an effect on the world and know what you're actually doing, you need to understand this or you are misguided. And I, you know, I have many political opinions, but I don't want to tie them to this thesis of this book. I want to present this book in terms of its key thesis and the evidence for it, and to separate my own personal political opinions from that, which I may well have, but that's not the basis of this talk or, or the evidence I'm trying to offer. I'm curious if uh, you know of any research that's been done uh, to uh, where you, you would test the group of people on the autism spectrum with those that aren't to see if the ones on the autism I think that's true to some so substantial degree, yes. There any yes, there is. I, I couldn't cite it specifically, but I've certainly come across things like that over the years. But they're usually very specific things. If you ask, is it true in general, I don't know. I know many specific results that are in that direction uh, that, that I've come across over the years, where autists are you know, more, less biased in various ways. So you've probably heard of behavioral economics, often mentioning many kind of biases. Many of those kind of biases don't exist in other animals. <laughs> They often don't exist on our human ancestors, and they often don't exist in aut people on the autism spectrum, because plausibly many of these biases are actually things we do on purpose wrong for social reasons. <laughs> uh, we are overconfident, say, plausibly for social reasons. Yes, we are in error when we're overconfident, but we gain social advantages by being overconfident. And if you are not very socially skilled, then you find it hard to know when exactly to be wrong <laughs> to gain the social advantages, and you're more likely to just play it straight. <laughs> Uh, just like if you're not very good at politics at the office, you often just take the keep your head down, don't, don't form alliances and just do your job well in the hope that that will avoid all the political entanglements, right? Because you're not very good at politics. You don't have very many political connections. You don't know how to read it. You don't want to play with it. So you just keep your head down. So in a sense, people who are less socially skilled are doing that in our social world as well. They're just trying to stay out of the, the social games and do the simple thing because they feel safer that way. You got to... Well, ask your first one, and then we'll see if somebody raised their hand. Okay. Well, the first question is, uh, every child's purpose is to ensure the long-term flourishment of humanity. Would you say there's a hidden motive there as well? You said FHS? Uh, future of humanity. Okay. 
Uh, sure, the long-term motive of humanity. I mean, look, just in general, you shouldn't be believing vision statements or mission statements. Those are just like complete propaganda almost everywhere. <laughs> that it would be silly to believe those things as, as more than a general, what we call aspirational guide. You know, you, almost all organizations have some. Just like this school has a mission statement somewhere, and I bet it's about learning the material and making you better citizens as a result, right? But that's not what you should believe about the school. They should believe that's the kind of image that people would like to project in the forum where people are not evaluating very carefully. So that would be true of, of, of any organization I've ever been associated with as well, probably. Uh, so as I said, academia pretends like we are trying to produce research progress and insight. That's, if you ask what do researchers like myself say we are trying to do, that is the claim we will make. We are doing difficult research, trying to figure out what's actually going on in various parts of the world in order so that the world can benefit from the accumulation of knowledge we produce. It doesn't explain our behavior very well. Our behavior is much better explained as a variation of conversation, as I talked about before. We stay within the fashion of what everybody's talking about. We say something related to that thing, even if it's not very important. And then we are very impressive with the things we say. So if you are ever, you know, submit an article to a journal and get a referee, if you're ever the referee, you should probably know the main standard a referee will use is, does this look hard? <laughs> Did you use difficult techniques, difficult skills? Was this not an easy thing to do? They almost never ask, what's the social value of this paper? <laughs> that just doesn't come up at all. <laughs> in journal refereeing and, and grant refereeing, et cetera. But we do a great job of credentialing impressiveness. So in fact, most of the professors at better schools are better in the sense that they can do more difficult things. They have larger vocabularies. They can do more math. They, they can produce more complicated statistical analysis. And that's our hidden agenda, is to win the contest, to be more impressive, so that we can be the people that the rest of you want to get classes from, right? You should ask yourself, look, when you guys chose a college, did you go say, where's the college I will find the best teachers and the ones who can most like walk me through things and will devote it to be good teachers to me? No. You said, what's the college with the most prestigious people regardless of what they're doing? If they come to class and mostly ignore me, I'm OK with that because, hey, I went to a prestigious college. Right? You certainly didn't ask, where are the professors doing the most to help the world? You did not ask that when you picked a college. Maybe you asked, where are the teachers better? But that was still pretty selfish, right? So this whole idea that we're all out there to help the world, that doesn't fit very well with our or your behavior. You don't pick us on the basis of whether we help the world. And we're not picking our research projects and our agendas based on whether we help the world. We are being impressive. You were impressed. And so that's why you're here and I'm here. That. talking about existential risk as opposed to statistical methods, right? Like, yeah. As, like, like, how can you, like, OK, we're solving this problem right now. Right. How can you apply statistical framework in a problem that we <coughs> have no empirical data, no, no empirical data? So, so the question to repeat is about the study of what's called existential risks, things that might kill us all forever. And the observation or claim is that you can't do statistics on things that would kill us all, because that only ever happens once, and it hasn't happened yet. So we have no data, literally, on things that could kill us all. So how can we study a thing we could kill us all? Now, uh, I will bring up the topic of my previous book, The Age of M. This is a book about the future. You might say, we have no data on the future, therefore we can't study the future, <laughs> right? And when it gets here, it'll no longer be the future, so it doesn't, won't qualify. The point is, we use all the data we have to produce our best theories, and then we can apply our best theories to subjects where there's no data, which is what we do in the future. So we take all the data we have, we summarize it into theory, and then we can apply those theories to the future. That's what this book. This book is just trying to apply all of our standard theories to the future. And you can do the same thing with existential risk. So for example, earthquakes. We have a lot of data on lots of earthquakes that have not killed everybody. And we can create a distribution of the size of earthquakes. And we see it's a power law with a power of roughly one. And we can use that to project what's the chance of a really enormous earthquake that could kill us all. 
Now, we can't test whether the curve actually continues with that shape up to that size event because, of course, we'll only ever see that event when it's too late. But we can still get data on the rest of all the earthquake distributions, make our best model of that, and then use that to project the things we don't see. Of course, that's what we're always doing, presumably. We're always using the best things we know to predict the world we haven't seen yet. And the point is to have good theories based on the things you know to help you predict the things you haven't seen. Is that a... No, not a hand. Is that, is that a hand? Thank you very much. Thank you all.